Many people get confused when they think about prayer. They think it means talking all the time to God. But centering prayer seems to be different. Centering prayer seems to be something mainly concerned with silence, which you say is the language of God and relationship. And for someone for whom that's a strange notion, how could that be clarified? For someone who's never come across this and thinks maybe, well, some kind of new age concept out of Eastern meditation? <laughs> well, um, Centering Prayer uh, came out of a desire to, to uh, renew and recover and reclaim the Christian contemplative tradition. And it could just be called contemplative prayer. It doesn't have to be called centering prayer. The problem was at the time, historically, contemplation had taken on several different meanings, maybe five or six different meanings, including mm. sometimes uh, opposing meanings. So sometimes it refers to looking at something actually like contemplating a tree or something or uh, mentally contemplating mm -hmm. some action or or uh, memory or or plan or any work of the imagination but so it's usually an object in this sense but the classical meaning of contemplation which it, i believe uh, comes out of uh, Matthew 6.6, 6, and which Jesus calls prayer in secret, is, is about a deepening relationship that involves, first of all, an intention to converse with God or to open to God or consent to the presence of God, and then moves on to listen to God. So listening is an act of silence, at least of sorts, because you you can't hear what somebody else is saying if it's too noisy or if you're talking. So, so the idea of prayer as relationship then emerges as the essence of the practice, which can then be expressed in many different ways. And the classical ways are through petition, asking for things, adoration, responding to God's transcendence and goodness, and then uh, responding in gratitude for the good things we receive from God or what we hear about in Scripture, and uh, a desire to express trust or love in, in this mystery that is laid before us in Scripture or in some other way. So, so prayer, prayers, give it the plural, are any of these things. But prayer itself might best be reserved for a basic disposition of relationship towards God based on one's present level of communion or conversation or at easeness with God in your ordinary life. So. If you're uh, scared to death of God, then you have a relationship to God, but it's not very appealing. It, it tends to make us want to run away or, or to postpone this to another time. So in Jesus' wisdom saying in Matthew 6.6, 6, where he speaks, uh, gives us a formula of prayer, which is also a formula for cultivating interior silence, we, we hear that uh, the first step is to enter our inner room, sometimes translated private room, but since most people didn't have a private room in those days, and the Desert Fathers understand this, uh, interpret this saying to refer to the spiritual level of our being. So, so the invitation that Jesus uh, extends here is to move in prayer. If you want to pray, enter your inner room to this uh, 
spiritual level of our being, which is the intuitive level and the level of the spiritual will, uh, which is the uh, realm of, of choice. So if I want to enter into this relationship, to pursue this path, what do I do? I know it's a not doing, but how do I do not doing? Well, first of all, there's a lot of things you have to do in the way of <coughs> bringing your life in, in its, on the conscious level in some accord with, with your aspiration. We have to uh, let go of some things that are obviously obstacles and cultivate uh, habits of mind and thought and behavior that are, are more conducive to, to this listening process. So in a way, what you're saying about centering prayer, it isn't like some of these other things on the market which offer you rest, relaxation, happiness, peace. You've described it as a series of humiliations of the false self, which doesn't sound like a very pleasant experience. Um, and then people talk about things like the dark night of the soul. And so really what the centering prayer is about seems to me a journey that isn't just the kind of superficial happiness that you might get from uh, having a restful period twice a day. Uh, yes, it's not a magic carpet to bliss, that's oh. for sure. It's a transformative process that involves, uh, if you want to put it bluntly, the death of the false self. But this shouldn't be a surprise to Christians since in baptism they already agreed to do this if they were uh, <laughs> conscious. <laughs> and the whole symbolism of the, of the baptismal rite is descent into the water, a symbol of descent into the uh, purification that is uh, the, uh, one of the symbols of water in the scripture. And then uh, the immersion out of the water, just immersion wouldn't do it. You, uh, you wouldn't be. Uh, you don't e emerge from nothing. You emerge from something. And so, what we emerge from is the attachment to the uh, sinful or self-centered might be a better word uh, projects of life that are rooted in the emotional programs for happiness and and excessive. Uh, dependence on a group. By that I mean that one is prepared to, to either not to think at all about a separate self or individuality or our own conscience or our own uh, uh, integrity, but to subject all of these things to the approval of the group in order to be accepted. This is not a healthy attitude in which is, which Jesus has attacked so strongly in that wisdom saying, uh, unless you give up your family and children and wife and uh, property and your inmost self, notice, you can't be my disciple. So the whole attachment or the whole life that built up around those instinctual needs for happiness has to be let go of. And saying goodbye seems to be really key to the whole process. Yes. Without regrets. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Goodbye and good luck. <laughs> but it, it, little by little then, we enter into prayer without intentionality except to consent. Mm -hmm. And consent becomes surrender, and surrender becomes total receptivity as this process evolves. And total receptivity is without effort is effortless, is peaceful, it's free, and has nothing to do with attaining something or getting anything, or the desire for enlightenment, the desire for peace, the desire for spiritual experience. All this is, is still ego, however devoutly uh, masked. So no thinking, no reflection, no desires, no words, no thing. 
So uh, everything is impermanent, which is another way of saying everything is, is changing. So uh, that's the very nature of reality. Uh, or to put it another way, God is not a noun, but uh, if he's a better metaphor would be a verb. That is, he's always happening. Hence, the thing that doesn't change about God is that he's always changing. So what uh, centering prayer is doing is trying to adapt us to this mystery of ultimate reality by uh, gradually persuading us to change and to let go of everything that prevents us from doing so. So as a penitential people, our chief job is to keep letting go of our attachments as we perceive them, especially those that we feel are opposed to love. One of these, obviously, would be an unwillingness to forgive. Another would be a tendency to judge others in a moral kind of context, including ourselves, mm. if this is uh, excessive. Um, so that basically the less we think of ourselves, the better this process goes, as well as the faster it goes. And so the, the uh, formula that Jesus gave us in Matthew 6.6, 6, which Centering Prayer is, is based on, is, is a kind of cascading movement of a deeper silence, uh, deeper listening, if you prefer, in which we first deliberately let go of the external tumult of the world or of our anxieties or concerns and turn it over to God for the 20 minutes, half an hour, or whatever time we're doing this prayer. So it, it's not a question of doing anything, but of being for these 20 minutes or whatever the time is. And when this is challenged by the usual flow of thoughts, which are inevitable, we simply quietly, without being annoyed or distressed, return to our original intention by some symbol, which has no inherent value in itself, but is simply a way of, of renewing or rejoining our consciousness or attentiveness to the general loving presence that we are calling God. As a, as a practical uh, disposition, when one sits down in Centering Prayer, we, our teaching is that this is a time to have no judgment about anything at all no judgment about the period of prayer, its psychological content, still less about what's happening in the world, still less about your judgment of other people or circumstances. All judgment, all that kind of reflection is, is not appropriate for the time of centering prayer, which is a time of sharing one's pure being with God. So it's not a time for action. It's a time for receptivity. It's a time for consenting to whatever is at this present moment. So it's an exercise of the present moment, of being with God totally in the present moment. So beyond this, then, in Centering Prayer, it's, it's what you don't do that counts most in Centering Prayer. So. So thoughts refer to any perception whatsoever during the time of prayer. But then since thoughts are inevitable given the human condition and the imagination as a perpetual motion faculty, the consent means to let what happens happen. So whatever thoughts come down the stream of consciousness, one does not resist, nor does one hang on to them which would be getting engaged with them. 
nor does one react emotionally to them or to the state of having them in the first place, such as irritation at having thought or discouraging commentaries such as, I guess I'm not qualified for this. In other words, it's just sitting down and being still, that is to say, shutting up on every level of shutting <laughs> up. And so it's just for a time, but it's sufficiently powerful to begin to undermine the thought patterns of the false self around the energy centers and over-identification with our group and so on. How can you help your capacity to receive? And maybe that's just everything we've been talking about, really. By giving up the false self. Uh -huh. That's what is busy doing something else. And what it's doing is useless. So by discontinuing that activity, one has a great deal of time for constructive activity. Uh -huh such a service of others, and still is resting even in the midst of the action. It seems to me paradoxical, though it sounds, that people who are on this journey, uh, who have succeeded to some extent of getting rid of this false self, yet appear more truly unique, more truly, they appear to be more individual than people who, have, who are hard at work creating it, their own individuality. Well, yes. <laughs> a kind of, un uh, a real uniqueness shows through, and it makes them extremely attractive to other people who want to be around that, that uh, beauty of the unique. Well, <laughs> all I can say to that is, uh, what are you waiting for? All you have to do is to stop being who you think you are, and you couldn't be more delightful because there's nothing more beautiful than the uniqueness that God has created. It's just buried like a diamond underneath a pile of garbage or something else. And that's not God's fault, but that's the, the misuse of our freedom and the imposition on us of all the negative forces in the environment and in, in our heredity and on our social milieu. So, so it is a job to climb out of those influences, but all the work is in letting go of those influences, not reinforcing them. You don't have to create the beauty, you've got the beauty. You don't have to create the freedom, you've got it. You don't have to create the image of God in you, you have it. You don't have to win over God's love. You have more than you know what to do with. You don't have to become more beautiful because nothing could be more beautiful in your own particular uniqueness. 